This is the first episode in a two-part series, and the third and final story in a larger season. This season covers cases in New Mexico. All season, we're supporting the New Mexico nonprofit, Angels Voices Silence No More. Please be sure to listen through the end of the episode for information. This episode covers a tragedy that includes the death of a child. This is the fall line. Mother's Day 2019 fell on Sunday, May 12th. It's a day that the family of Calvin Willie Martinez won't forget. It's the last time they heard from him. Calvin, better known as CW to his family, called his mother, Aldina, that afternoon. Aldina, who lives outside Farmington, had been waiting to hear from Calvin. She and the rest of the family had been worried about him for a long time. For close to five years, Calvin had been struggling with the after effects of an immense tragedy. In 2014, Calvin lost his wife and one of his children in a horrific house fire. He and his oldest son were the only survivors. His grief was immense. Anyone's would be. When his eldest sister, Becky Martinez, spoke with NBC, she explained, quote, it changed him. It changed all of us. They were our family. He was never the same after that. He didn't want to work. He seemed lost. He just slipped into a deep depression. Becky told us that Aldina, their mother, cared for Calvin's oldest son while Calvin tried to find stability. She said he struggled with both drinking and depression. And though he'd worked in the family business prior to the fire, he found himself drifting afterward. He traveled around New Mexico, mostly back and forth between Farmington and the Albuquerque area which is a distance of about 180 miles. Because Calvin did not have a car in 2019, Becky told us that he'd catch rides or often hitchhike. Calvin did call his family, especially his mother, to check in, but he did not always have a phone of his own. Becky told us that he'd often lose track of them. So it wasn't unusual for them to receive phone calls from unknown numbers and to hear Calvin's voice on the other end. On May 12, 2019, his call came in from a Love's truck stop in Albuquerque. Aldina didn't know that at first, though. Becky told us that when he called, he'd promise he'd be home later to see the family. But then, the call cut off suddenly. His mother thought that maybe it had been dropped, so she tried to get him back on the line. The police report notes that when she couldn't, she googled that number. That's when she discovered it was a payphone at a truck stop. Eventually, they learned that Calvin had been at a gathering, a party or a barbecue, elsewhere in Albuquerque earlier in the day, that he'd left after some kind of disagreement or altercation. Then he'd somehow made his way to the Loves, where he called his mother. But what happened after that? His family doesn't know, and they've been searching for Calvin ever since. More than five years now. According to the International Business Times, Aldina reached out to Calvin's, quote, friends and ex-girlfriends. But just like her, quote, they have no clue as to where Calvin is. As she told the International Business Times, quote, it's a nightmare not knowing where he is or what he's doing or if he's safe. If someone did something to him, it's overwhelming and heartbreaking. I feel like I'm not doing enough, but I just keep going. I have to. I have to find my son. Becky, Calvin's sister, tells us the family has searched city streets, shelters, highways, spoken to law enforcement, put out the word on social media, attended rallies, tried to track Calvin's phone records, and to find out more about some strange phone calls they've received. But so far, there's been no movement in his case. As with every other case we've discussed this season, there have been jurisdictional issues in Calvin's. Calvin disappeared in one area, but he lived in another. The BIA, or Bureau of Indian Affairs, has also been brought in to assist. In a Source New Mexico article covering MMIP, or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Person Cases, throughout the state, his sister Becky's frustration with those issues was featured. Per Source New Mexico, quote, Martinez spoke about the repeated trauma she's had to go through while looking for answers, as she tearfully addressed the meeting's attendees. Much of finding her brother has been repetition. She's had to give the same testimony over and over. She bounced between jurisdictions, trying to report his disappearance, only to be told that she'd have to go somewhere else. 
a cotton swab test she'd done still hasn't appeared in the system, and she wondered if that was yet another step that she'd have to complete again, end quote. Becky met with representatives of a number of law enforcement agencies in November of 2023 to discuss Calvin's case. This was a direct result of her participation in the November 4th, 2023 Navajo Nation Missing Persons Day in Fort Defiance, Arizona. When she attended the event, she spoke with a Farmington Police Department detective, who then brought in other agencies to discuss Calvin's case that day. There are complex issues as to why this meeting occurred, and we'll get into those next episode. Via FOIA request, we were provided with both a police report and a recording of that meeting. You'll hear some clips of it throughout these episodes. The audio provides some important context regarding some facts and questions surrounding Calvin's disappearance. We should also note that Calvin's case is the first in this series, in which the lead investigating agency has agreed to speak on record about his case and to participate in an interview regarding his disappearance. So you'll hear those updates in our second episode. We spoke with Becky in two interviews that took place several weeks apart. Like everyone else featured this season, she's working with lawyer and advocate Darlene Gomez, who's volunteered thousands of hours in support of MMIWR and MMIP cases across New Mexico. When we spoke with Becky, she told us about her family's history in the area, her parents, and her step-parents and siblings. My mom's mom, my Musene, her name is Lucy Lopez, Lucy Garito Lopez, actually. She's um, from Lybrook, New Mexico, and her father was from around the same area in between Naizi and Lybrook out on the Navajo Reservation. And then my grandparents on my dad's side, my Nullies, they settled right there in Naizi, New Mexico. I grew up there and in Upper Fruitland, New Mexico. We had a farm, we had cattle, we had horses, we had hay, we had corral, a barn. I even remember the barn catching fire from too much hay being in there at one point. We had goats, we had chickens. We had fields, we grew corn, squash, watermelon, all that stuff. It was really fun. And that was the part that I loved the most about growing up was being with my grandparents. And then like you go get potatoes up the hill, you know, because Navajo Nation has one of the largest potato factories in the United States. My mom and my dad, they met, I believe, when they were young, um, I don't know if they met through my grandparents, but I know that my mom said that she she always talks about going and doing rodeo and stuff when they were younger and seeing my dad there. And she said that, you know, he always wanted to be her boyfriend, but she said that she just she just wanted to ride horses. Her mom told her, you know, you're there to ride horses and and have fun. And then I guess they went to school off at, in Salt Lake. And um, they went to the boarding school out there in Salt Lake. So they got shipped off that way. And all of my mom and her siblings, I think, went to Salt Lake. And so did my dad. The boarding school Becky mentions is part of the United States' wide-ranging Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative, a government-funded program analogous to Canadian residential schools that you may have heard more about in the media. Wide-ranging effects of the U.S. boarding school policies have barely begun to be investigated. That's despite, per the Department of the Interior, quote, the policies establishing and supporting Indian boarding schools across the nation being in place for over 150 years, through the 1970s. According to the Washington Post, at least 523 such schools were in operation during that period, and religious groups operated, quote, about a third of them. Per the Department of the Interior, quote, the purpose of federal Indian boarding schools was to culturally assimilate American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children by forcibly removing them from their families, communities, languages, religions, and cultural beliefs. While children attended federal boarding schools, many endured physical and emotional abuse, 
and in some cases, died. Per the Department of the Interior, quote, a first ever investigation of the federal Indian boarding school system was begun in the last four years. According to NPR, this was a project undertaken at the direction of Interior Secretary Deb Holland, who set out in 2023 on the, quote, Road to Healing Tour, a months-long effort to hear from boarding school survivors about their experiences. There's much more on this topic than we can cover in one episode, but we have linked to some reading material in our show notes so that you can learn more. Becky told us that while her mother was at work, she and her younger siblings spent a lot of time at her grandmother's house, and it was an incredibly formative experience. My maternal grandmother, my mom's mom, she was kind of like our second mom, like the more really stern one, because my mom was always at work, and she had us like 50% of the time she had us, and my grandparents, my dad's parents had us too when we were growing up between the ages of 8 and 15. So we were still pretty much with them and communicated with them. My grandpa, when my dad was in his alcoholic state, my grandpa would come and bring us food and, you know, give us money and make sure we were taken care of. And he encouraged my mom to leave my dad because he knew my my dad wasn't going to be a good father. But I think that stems from... Now, like, I really look at it and I study it is because he had trauma when he was young. He lost his brother in a wreck. From what I gather is that his brother got hit in front of him and he may have have passed away in his arms. And I think that's what my brother felt, too, because he would always say, I wish I wish dad was different. I wish dad would be a dad to us, you know? Because he never felt, and I never felt it either, like a good fatherly love from him. And he always wanted to have a relationship with him. When my mom was at work, I was with my brothers. And there was no one else besides my grandma. And my grandma was only fluent in Navajo. So I was the interpreter, like little Navajo girl interpreter running around with this older lady, Navajo, who doesn't speak good English. Her kids were sent off to boarding school in Salt Lake, so she didn't have her kids for the longest time. And now that they're here back with their grandkids, you know, she she kept us close. And um, I guess that's where you find your difference between cultures, growing up Native American and then living in a white society. You know, it's... Not everybody's story is the same. When I was growing up and I was small, I used to walk from Swinburne Elementary with my brother. And these white kids used to throw rocks at us. They were either junior high or high school. And we used to walk to the library, too. And there were people that were on the streets and they would throw trash at them. And you think, like, who raised you? Because my grandma and grandpa, if they see me do that to anybody, I'll get spanked on my butt. Like, who are your parents? And they taught you to act like this? I don't think, like, when you're growing up, you think, oh, I'm traumatized. Or, oh, it's trauma. You know, you're just going through this shit. You're not worried about, oh, am I hurting? Or if you're hurting, you're not going to let anybody know. And when, like, even... With him going missing, he did have trauma. And I didn't even realize that that was trauma until November of this past year. And it's been four years already at that point. But this is going in there and being trying to figure out what happened and what wrong, what went wrong. Where did we go wrong as a family? I mean, what could we have done? And what can I do to help other families not go through what we went through? It is, it is trauma-based, you know, it is all the things that we went through growing up, striving, single mom, you know, my mom, she, she tried her hardest to do it on her own with us. You know, my stepdad was there, but 
financial burdens and stuff still lit rid on my mom, you know, and until I was 15, my grandpa helped her. And then after that, it was kind of like, okay, Becky's old enough. She can get her own job. I thought to myself, so my mom doesn't have to take care of me no more. So I just started working and I continue to go to school and everything, but I graduated late, but I've been working since I was 15 and even before that. So we've, we've always worked our whole lives, you know, me and my brothers. We didn't, we didn't have anything given to us. We worked our asses off and I, I still do. I still have to. Not everybody's entitled to riches and gold like some people are. Becky explains that she and Calvin's time together, what they faced in school, and the time they spent together at their grandparents meant that they were very tightly bonded. And then if I go somewhere, he'd cry because my mom wasn't there. And then he was constantly tugging at your shirt, like constantly, just because he wanted to feel your skin and he would be okay. He'll stop crying. And you're like, you're such a weirdo, you know? You know, but he was, he's always, he was always by me. And then um, when I moved to Albuquerque, he was right behind me. I'm the oldest from the three kids that my mom and my dad had together. It goes me, Becky, um, Rondi Rex, Martinez, and then Calvin Willie, CW. We grew up, well, we, we started to grow up in Upper Fruitland. And um, my mom and my dad, they separated when I was around nine. So then um, my mom was working at Whataburger when, at that time. She was getting ready to transfer to a job to the Daily Times and she reunited with my now stepfather. They had two kids together, which are twins, Blaine and Warren. And then my stepdad already had kids from two previous marriage or two previous relationships. And he had um, four kids with his ex-wife. And then there was a lady before her too as well. And he had two kids with her. And then my dad had four kids up in Dulce. So that's what a total of about 18 or 13 kids almost. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm the oldest of all of them. So my, my stepsister and I were the only girls in our family. And then that was the eight of us. And then... Later on, like when we were like maybe 17, 18, around that time, we found out about my stepdad's other kids, the older two girls. And then they explained it to us. And we're like, oh, okay, you know, we're already a family. So what are we going to do? Just might as well add somebody. And the family dynamic was pretty huge. So it's a huge family. Oh, yeah. Um, we used to have Sunday dinners all the time. We we would eat every Sunday um, at my mom and my stepdad's. Every Sunday we ate a big cookout and we were just always all together and we spent family time together. I guess over time, it was like we were a hit, finally becoming a big, huge unit family as one, but then with everyone getting their own lives and growing up, you know, it just gets fast and everybody's constantly going and then boom, someone's missing. And since he went missing, we lost my stepbrother and my stepsister, which are my stepdad's two kids that we grew up with since we were, I was probably eight or nine. And so um, it's been pretty hard. And we, we lost my stepmom too. And 
my other half sister Rebecca from Dulce. So losing all those people in the past now I I can say five years has been pretty tough being the matriarch of the family, I guess you could say. When Becky and Calvin were still young, she moved to Albuquerque and he decided to follow. Always right by me is what she told us. And Becky said he loved it there. He moved out there with me. And that's how he met his kids' mom. And he just enjoyed it so much. He felt so free. He's like, I don't want to go home. Calvin was still a teenager when he met the future mother of his children. And Becky didn't realize how serious their relationship was, not at first. She was working a lot at the time, but she said she'd come home to their place and find Calvin and his girlfriend there. And it was clear to her that they'd already settled into a loving routine. I used to work at Express Scripts. It was a mail order pharmacy, so I'd be gone majority of the day. And sometimes I'd come home and there was dinner on the table and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? You know, my brother would cook, but it's not going to be that good, you know. But I'd come home to, like, Navajo tacos and chiladas, and she worked at Poncho's. So she she was a waitress and a, and a cook, too. Next thing you know, they moved back. They, they told my mom that they were going to have a baby, and my mom told them to move back, and they moved back. And so since then, after that, he just stayed home and worked and... He provided for his family. He was a construction worker. He worked a lot. He was an artistic, more hands-on, active, mess-around kind of guy. You know, just the kind of comedian kind of guy. Becky said that Calvin settled easily into family life. He and his partner eventually moved next door to their mother, Aldina, with their little family. And he worked with his stepfather and brothers in their construction business that his stepfather had built. They had two boys, and I've been searching for a picture. I have a picture with all four of them, and um, I think that's probably one of the last pictures they have together of all of them. It was on December 23rd. Um, it was late at night, around midnight. And I got up, and I just heard yelling, and my brother had put my nephew out of the trailer, and... He was climbing out, and then I just remember a bunch of smoke, and everybody was just trying to figure out what to do, and smoke just kept coming out. And after that, it's blur. Yeah, that's, that's just not a good night. According to the Daily Times, it was about 1230 when, quote, the father, Calvin, was not named in the article at the time. Quote, found himself trapped with his two boys and partner inside a burning mobile home off County Road 7050, where several members of the family live on the property. He couldn't open the door, so he walked to the window and broke it, dropping his six-year-old son out. The father then climbed out himself. Something inside exploded, and the father started screaming. End quote. Aldina had already run to get water, but the blaze was too intense. She and her other son, quote, a volunteer firefighter, attempted to put it out while they waited for the fire trucks to arrive. According to the Daily Times, quote, that son and her stepson-in-law tried to tear a hole in the wall of the mobile home while the others held back the father of the boy and husband of the mother trapped inside. Calvin's brothers reached in through that fire to try and save his wife and youngest child, but they couldn't reach them in time. According to a later report from the Albuquerque Journal, the San Juan County Fire Department found that a wood-burning stove had been the cause of the fire. Becky said that as soon as she heard, she rushed to the hospital. A number of her family members were being treated there for injuries. But it soon became apparent to her that her sister-in-law and her youngest nephew had not survived. Yeah, I found out not too long after I got to the hospital. But we had to wait a while because... They had to really identify them and 
stuff with their dental records and everything. I think we buried them in January and my sister-in-law's family wanted her to be buried in on the reservation in Arizona where she grew up. And my brother said, you know, if that's what they want, you know, so they're buried in White River, Arizona. A January 2015 Daily Times article describes Calvin's youngest son, Kenyon, as a four-year-old who, quote, loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and professional wrestling and talked about being a bull-riding cowboy when he grew up. He died weeks before his fifth birthday, January 12th. His mother, Sherilyn Novadon Rustin, was just 24. Her obituary lovingly describes her as, quote, a full-time mother to her sons, a beautiful young lady with a huge care for everyone she ever met. She was a wonderful cook, open to adventure, a great listener, and a chatterbox. Her sister described Calvin to the Daily Times as Sherilyn's soulmate and said that she'd, quote, loved Calvin with all her heart. Calvin's surviving son was just six when his mother and brother died. Calvin himself was only 26. He'd spent his 20s devoted to raising his family, though other family members, local churches, and the community gathered around them after the fire. Calvin's losses went far beyond the immediate needs of shelter and donations. He was anguished over their deaths, and caring for his surviving son, it was difficult in that state. We didn't want to separate them. We wanted them to stay together as much as they could, and in the process of that, you know, we got my brother another apartment. The community really helped by donating a lot of money to help him get restarted again. We put him up in an apartment. I think that depression kind of took over, the loss of his family. And so that's when he started really drinking. And um, he wasn't being a sober dad. My mom was worried about him going, taking my nephew to school intoxicated. So my mom decided to take my nephew from him. And he was still living on his own, and then he eventually lost his apartment. And then that's how he ended up back at my mom's. Um, that took about a year. And then after that, just him moving from place to place and couch surfing until he went missing. That didn't mean that Calvin stopped seeing his son, but his mother had taken over his day-to-day -day care. Becky said that they still spent time together, but she had to limit her own time with her brother, not because she didn't want to see him, but to protect her own sobriety. I spent a lot of time with the Landers on my own and not with him because of his drinking. So with him drinking so much, we kept him away from that. We didn't want him around him when he was drinking. So Elandris never got to experience a lot of the time after his mom and brother left with his dad. So he stayed with grandma. So they really didn't interact that much, only when he came home. Becky says that Calvin's construction work became more sporadic than the years after the fire. He spent a lot of time traveling around the region. Eventually, he got into a few new relationships, and he made friends that his family didn't know as well. When she spoke with law enforcement in Arizona in the fall of 2023, one of the agents present asked Becky to describe Calvin, specifically to give them a picture of what his life was like in the months leading up to his disappearance. We really depend and rely on families to tell us everything about their loved ones. And sometimes you may not even know things about your loved one that's yeah. missing, okay? But sometimes I always find that being the key part and important key components in looking for somebody, knowing who your brother is. Mm -hmm. And that is the only way. For me, I like to know, one, who your brother is, what was he into, his friends, did he work? And anything prior, before he left, what was he doing and so forth? Yeah. Was he in the vehicle or anything like that? Um, no, he didn't have a vehicle. 
He was always walking on foot. Um, he stopped using a vehicle because he was always drinking. I don't think he was using substances. I think maybe just weed. But I, I could be wrong because he did, the last time I seen him, he was not all there because I was taking him into Farmington and he was talking to himself and, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm like, is it the alcohol or whatever? But, you know, he always worked and he always came home. He always called my mom. He always gave me money. He always told me, sis, how can I help you? But nobody in my family ever did that to him. And he was very loving and caring person. And he had kids with somebody else who I shared with this officer. He was in farming here. Next thing you know, he's in Dulce. Next thing you know, he's in Albuquerque. Next thing you know, he's somewhere else again, calling from somewhere to get picked up. And it's like, not that month, but before then, before May, before he went missing. So back on Mother's Day, do you remember or recall that you guys had planned? I mean, did you say he was going anywhere or had anything planned? He just told my mom he was coming home. And he always comes home. He's usually home by the end of the day. You mentioned that he would call, but did he have a cell phone? No, he called from the gas station that was at the truck stop. Which one do you know? Um, off of Central on I-40, going by by Mile Hill. It was new at that time. It was a brand new, brand new store, I believe. And he said he was on his way home and didn't ask to be picked up this time? No. And he stopped asking to be picked up because it was just like sometimes we'd go to pick him up and then he wouldn't want to be picked up. What was his purpose being it? I mean, what was he doing in Albuquerque? We don't know. He was just popping in back and forth. He was unstable. And maybe he was trying to find a purpose again. I don't know. And maybe he was happier out there because he avoided home after the fire. He didn't want to be where we were because it brought back too many memories. I mean, he lost his life with his son at home. I mean, he knew the bus system. He knew everything about Albuquerque. Like, he knew where to eat for free. He knew where to get stuff if you needed to go shower. You know, he told me, oh, yeah, you know. I was down there at Joy Junction, I ate and whatever, and I met this person, and, you know, they helped me get me back to Farmington. I don't know who the person is, but, you know, like, things like that, he'd tell me, you know. There was one other thing that Becky remembered during her interview that struck her as strange. She said that just before Calvin disappeared, he changed his Facebook profile photo, and she remembered it being odd. Her brother was active on Facebook, and he usually didn't do anything that she considered to be strange. But this time, he posted a picture that seemed ominous, like a sort of message or clue when she thought back to it. Here's what she told law enforcement during her interview. It's a photo of an eye, which is weird. Like black and white? No, like the eye. Like, oh, like you're not, you're not you yeah. an eye? And I'm like you put an eye for you know and I'm like does that mean you're watching us or are we supposed to be watching for you and then I'm, I'm going over here thinking <clears throat> these are subliminal messages too because you never know someone might be trying to give you a message and you just won't buy back to it so I look into those things too and I thought that was weird that he did that right after he went missing or before he went missing. Calvin uploaded that illustration in late March of 2019. Becky told us that even with this strange illustration, she wasn't truly worried. Not at first. When Calvin didn't show up for Mother's Day, they were concerned. But at first, they assumed he'd be home. But then days passed. And still, there was nothing. Well, when he went missing, it was like, 
I thought, like, he was just, like, on a binge and not calling, you know? And I was like, he'll be back, Mom. He'll be back, you know? And then she came to me again a second time. And she's like, Becky, he's really, he's not calling. He's not. He hasn't shown up. He said he was coming home. And he always said, he always did. And she says, I feel like something's wrong. You know? I said, okay. So my boyfriend and I, we got in the car and we went with my mom to Bernalillo to file the missing persons report again. This was the second time. My mom tried already once before. And they told her to come back to Farmington. And then we came back to Farmington. Farmington told us he went missing in Bernalillo. You need to go to Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department. And file a missing person report. We had been going back and forth already for maybe two or three weeks of trying to file the report. And so we went down there and I was pissed off. I was mad. So we ended up going into Albuquerque and driving the streets and walking the streets and looking for him. We went down alleys. We seen and you walk into these places thinking, like, this is really going on in real life. And you find yourself in some of the places you never thought you would, you would walk and or talk to people that you think wouldn't even help you, but are the kindest people. And they're the homeless. The homeless are more willing to help you than the police. That's sad. When Becky met with multiple agencies in 2023, one officer asked her whether Calvin's permanent residence was in Farmington or on the Navajo Nation Reservation, which led her to explain some of the issues that she'd faced. When Becky mentions the checkerboard, she's referring to an eastern border area made up of reservation and non-reservation land. We originally went to the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. Um, and from there, they told us that it wasn't their jurisdiction and that we needed to go to the Navajo Nation. So we came to the Navajo Nation and the Navajo Nation said that we couldn't do a report here because he didn't come missing from the Navajo Nation. He went missing from Albuquerque or Farmington. And then we went to Farmington and that's where... It's been kind of just waiting for answers. And that's when we and, took the report and entered him as a missing person. Yes. Um, well, we live on the checkerboard, so it's not considered a reservation as well. Um, there's other stipulations of land and rural regulations of the Navajo Nation, so they don't consider that reservation, but it's checkerboard. So it's not actual Navajo land, but it has some rights to Navajo land. So, and it's, it's all boundaries and jurisdictions. How do we get someone in the system in, United, in New Mexico that's from New Mexico into the system without saying, send them here? Send them here. Why did I get that right around with my mom? I don't want that for anybody else. I want that to change. Okay. At the time of his disappearance, Calvin Willie Martinez was 31 years old. He'd be 36 today. Calvin is a Native American male. He's about five foot six and around 200 pounds. He has brown hair, brown eyes, and a number of tattoos, including one on his right arm that reads Martinez Family. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Calvin Willie Martinez, please call the Farmington Police Department tip line 505 505- 599-1068 or San Juan County Crime Stoppers at 505-334-8477. Next week, September 14th, 2024, Becky is holding an MMIWR MMIP Awareness Rally in Grants, New Mexico in City Hall Park from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. She's highlighting Calvin's case 
but she's also seeking to support any other families who need it, especially if their relatives disappeared on the interstate. You can find more information about joining her there in our social media. Next time on The Fall Line, we continue the story of the disappearance of Calvin Willie Martinez and what you can do to help further his family search for him today. Darlene Gomez has been assisting the family of Calvin, and we want to highlight that she has a nonprofit that also needs support. It's called MMIWR in Dean Country. The nonprofit was, quote, created to provide advocacy, awareness, and prevention-oriented resources for relatives of a missing or murdered Indigenous person in Indian Country. There's a link in our show notes so you can learn more. Thank you for listening. This season, we're supporting Angels Voices Silence No More, a New Mexico nonprofit founded by our friend Eric Carter Londeen, the brother of Jacob Londeen. According to their mission statement, Angels Voices Silence No More's goal is to, quote, empower families by providing them with the necessary resources and referrals to advocate for their missing or murdered loved ones. We believe in taking a comprehensive approach to support, encompassing a wide range of services, including billboards, DNA testing, private investigations, funeral expenses, therapy, and much more. Our goal is to ensure that no family faces these challenges alone. End quote. You can join us in donating to their mission. And if you can't donate right now, that's okay. Sharing their charitable initiatives would be a huge help. You can find all the relevant links in our show notes. The Fall Line is an independent podcast, and we appreciate listener support. It allows us to do research, obtain FOIA to pay our content advisors, and support and donate to the causes we care about. If you try out the products we advertise, please use our sponsor codes. It really helps. And please take a moment to rate and review our show in your podcast app of choice. My book, Lay Them to Rest, which covers years of my life working on a Jane Doe case and the world of forensic scientists who resolve unidentified persons cases, is out everywhere as hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, read by me. You can order it anywhere you get books and through your local library. Find out more in the link in our show notes. If you'd like to support the show and the stories we cover, join us on Patreon or Apple Premium. 100% of our Patreon and Apple Premium earnings are supporting our Family Therapy Fund and actively paying for therapy for families who've appeared on the show. On Patreon, you can get early release ad-free versions of our regular episodes for $5 a month. If you prefer Apple Premium, you can subscribe there as well. On Patreon, we also post occasional giveaways, updates, and blogs, which all patrons can enjoy, starting at just a dollar. The Fall Line is written, hosted, and researched by Laura Norton. Interviews by Brooke Hargrove. Produced, engineered, and scored by Maura Curry. Content advisement by Vic Kennedy. And, as always, our most special thanks to Liz Lipka. Mm-hmm.